Okay, we're gonna get started. Thanks. So I'm so excited that this issue is getting spoken about more. Um, the aquatic animal law, it's pretty new. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our two panelists. Um, Kathy Hessler is a clinical professor of law at Lewis and Clark Law School. She graduated with a JD from William and Mary Law School and received her LLN from Georgetown University Law Center. Professor Hessler was previously a board member of the Animal Legal Defense Fund. She was the chair and founder of the American Association of Law Schools Animal Law Section. She also co-authored Animal Law in a Nutshell and Animal Law New Perspectives on Teaching Traditional Law and has written numerous law review and other articles. Among other animal law classes, Professor Hessler teaches the Animal Law Clinic at Lewis and Clark. Last year, she started the newest project of the Animal Law Clinic, the Aquatic Animal Law Initiative, which is the first in the country and in the world to focus on questions broadly relating to the legal protection of aquatic animals. Lori Marino is a neuroscientist and expert in animal behavior and intelligence who was on the faculty of Emory University for 20 years. Lori is currently president of the Whale Sanctuary Project, whose mission is to create the first seaside sanctuary for orcas and beluga whales in North America. She's also a founder and executive director of the Camilla Center for Animal Advocacy, which is a science-based nonprofit organization focused on bringing academic scholarship to animal protection efforts. Lori is internationally known for her work on the evolution of the brain and intelligence in dolphins and whales, as well as primates and farmed animals. She has published 130 peer-reviewed scientific papers, book chapters, magazine articles on marine mammal biology and cognition, comparative brain anatomy, self-awareness in animals, human-non-human -human animal relationships, the evolution of intelligence, marine ma mammal captivity issues, and my favorite, the educational claims of the zoo and aquarium industry. <laughs> so Lori's going to get us started. Thank you so much for having me. This is really an honor, and I'm very excited to be here and, and to hear about, you know, just just what the title is, The Emergence of Aquatic Animal Law, because it's a long time uh, coming, and I'm very happy to be here with, with uh, Kelly and, and Kathy, and uh, we'll get started. So today, uh, I want to go through a few things with you. Who are the animals that I'm talking about? Because there are a lot of animals that live in the sea. What are the impacts of captivity on those animals? How do those issues interface with conservation? What are the legal protections and efforts that are current in the United States for those animals? What is still needed, which is quite a bit? And I'll tell you a bit about our current project, the Whale Sanctuary Project. So who are the aquatic animals I'm talking about? Well, these are them. The order of mammals called cetaceans, dolphins, porpoises, and whales. And specifically, what we're discussing are the suborder odonocetes, about 73 species of toothed whales, dolphins, and porpoises. Most people, well, no. Most people know about the delphinids and a little bit about the belugas and narwhals and the porpoises, um, but there are actually six different families um, that comprise the odonocetes. And here's a, a sort of a summary of captivity by the numbers because it's the odonocetes that are the target of capt captivity entertainment research. There are around 3,000 whales, dolphins, and porpoises representing about 10 species or hybrids of species held in captivity around the world. In North America alone, there are about 481 bottlenose dolphins 80 beluga whales, and 25 orcas and other species living in concrete tanks right now. 
Uh, there are currently 60 orcas in captivity, uh, with about half of them being captive born uh, and the other half being captured from their natal waters. And there are about 14 marine parks in eight countries who are holding them. They are growing uh, in, quote, popularity in Asia and in Russia. SeaWorld, right here in the United States and in Laurel Parque, Spain, holds 22 of those orcas. And at least 91% of all the or orcas taken into captivity since 1961 have perished. So I'm going to be concentrating on my, on, in this talk on orcas, but the same goes for belugas, bottlenose dolphins, and other cetaceans who are kept in concrete tanks. This is uh, Orsinus orca, otherwise known as the killer whale. And I just want to give you a little idea about who they are. Uh, the orcas are large, obviously, very complex beings with large, very complex, convoluted brains. In fact, their neocortex, the part of the outer part of the brain that's evolutionarily the newest part of the brain, is more convoluted than ours and actually takes up more of their total brain than ours does. So if we want to consider that as a measure of brain advancement, um, they supersede us. They have a long childhood period of many years characterized by extensive learning and they are travelers. They can travel over 100 miles a day and dive to well over 200 meters when foraging. They have a very complex social uh, communi communication system and complex social networks um, and they engage in collaborative and cooperative foraging. They have lifelong family bonds. This is very important. And they are mostly matrilineal. They are also strongly cultural beings. And that's very, very important to keep in mind uh, when we think about uh, what they go through living in concrete tanks and also uh, the challenges that they face in, in the wild as well. So here's the bottom line. There's a lot of scientific evidence about this and there is no question that there is a fundamental mismatch between what orcas and other cetaceans need to thrive and the conditions of living in marine parks and aquariums. I like to put it as we're trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. It doesn't matter what the intentions are, it doesn't work. Here's an infographic just to give you an idea of the, the kinds of, the, the extent of the limitation in their ability to move in even the largest tanks that are available to them. An orca at SeaWorld, okay, where they have the largest tanks, would have to swim the circumference of their main pool, their largest pool, 1,400 times to match the equivalent daily distance traveled in the wild, daily. So when we talk about orcas in tanks swimming around and around and around in a circle, we literally mean orcas swimming around and around and around in a circle. So what are the impacts of living in concrete tanks? Um, <laughs> they're disastrous, as you can imagine. Uh, and orcas living in marine parks suffer from chronic stress-related physiological, uh, anatomical, and psychological conditions. Uh, 
Some of those conditions include uh, mortality from pneumonia and other lung diseases or gastrointestinal ulcers and diseases. We have candidiasis in, in captive orcas. There's never been a single report of that in a wild orca and cancer. All of these diseases are related to the chronic stress of living in, in such a, a deprived environment, working on their immune system, um, and eventually creating a situation where they are overwhelmed with infectious disease. To add to that, they're given antibiotics on a regular basis, so by the time they pre present with any kind of disease, they are antibiotic resistant. That is what happened to Tilikum uh, in SeaWorld uh, Orlando. By the time he was ailing, he was so pumped up with antibiotics, he was resistant to anything that they could do to treat him for his disease. They also exhibit uh, all kinds of behavioral stereotypes, stereotypes rather, um, and this means repetitive behavior that doesn't have any purpose, it just serves to stimulate them or to uh, make them feel less stressed. One of those behavioral stereotypes is grinding the teeth on the grates and the, 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 the uh, sides of the concrete walls. This is uh, a photograph of Tillicum's teeth, or what was left of them while he was in captivity. And there's a new peer-reviewed scientific paper out just this week where they looked at, uh, where the authors looked at dental pathology in orcas in four different marine parks, all owned by SeaWorld, and they found that 62% of all of the orcas had some kind of uh, severe or moderate dental pathology. What do they do? They drill their teeth every single day to prevent infection. Why do they have to drill their teeth? Because they're so bored and so crazy from living in concrete tanks that they are gnawing and self-mutilating. Um, they are also in very poor muscular condition. And they also exhibit psychological disorders that uh, present as hyperaggression towards humans as well as each other. This is a example, this is um, a photograph of Corky who rammed into, well this is Candu, who was uh, on the receiving end of, a, of an aggression by uh, Corky. Corky rammed her um, and Candu bled out in front of the whole audience and died. Um, this does not happen in free-ranging orcas. It's just not ever something that you would ever see because they have room to disperse and therefore disperse their stress. They become often poor parents because they don't have the learning experience from their own mothers and aunts and grandmothers about how to take care of their kids. And they often suffer from depression. Their life expectancy is really cut short. Uh, most orcas who uh, are in captivity only live to about four or five years old. Um, and you can see here, these are data from the Whale and Dolphin Conservation Society. The median uh, survival time uh, for uh, 33 orcas that were born in captivity is 4.5. These animals live in the wild to 50 to 60 if you're a male, 80 to 90 if you're a female. So you can you get the idea of how short their lives are cut. So what's going on here? Why are we still doing this? Well, you know, this, is, this goes back a long time. For dolphins and whales, it really is a two-edged problem. So this is, this is what we're dealing with. We're loving them to death, but we also lack empathy for them. At the same time, 
How are we loving them to death? Well, we understand that they're intelligent like we are. And we want to be close to that intelligence. We want to be close to somebody who's like us. And therefore, we put them in concrete tanks so we can see them all the time. Or we can ride on top of them, or we can pet them, and, and so on and so forth. Um, there is this mythology that's gone on for thousands of years that they're here to heal and rescue us. And dolphin-assisted therapy um, is, is, comes right out of that notion that, yeah, dolphins and are so special, they're even better than us, they can heal us. And that results in, in abuse. Um, and this whole notion that they're special, somehow dolphins and whales are special. They're so special that we can't let them lead their lives and they have to be in concrete tanks. And at the same time, we see them as though they are fish and other sea creatures. And I want to say that that doesn't mean that fish and other sea creatures uh, don't suffer abuse. It's, it's some of the worst abuses in the world, and we saw that last night with Jonathan's uh, talk. But the assumption that they are like fish means that they suffer the same biases that we have against fish and other animals, and we don't see them for who they are. So everybody suffers. We also lack empathy for them because they're difficult to read. Just as mentioned with fish, where their eyes don't blink, we, they don't have the kinds of facial expressions we have. So we think they're happy all the time. And the Rick O'Barry said that the dolphin smile is nature's greatest uh, deception, right? So here's a picture of a beluga whale and a little girl. And the little girl is looking at the beluga whale. And this picture went around. People said, oh, how cute. The beluga whale is amused by the little girl. He's smiling. He's just, he's trying to communicate. Uh-uh. That's open mouth aggression display. That beluga whale is saying, back off. I don't have any space, and I don't want you here. And if you know how to read cetaceans, you understand the emotions of that animal. Otherwise, you think that animal is perfectly happy to be hanging out with this little visitor. So where do captivity and conservation issues intersect? So broadening this out a little bit. Well, how we treat other animals has everything to do with objectification and commoditization of them. Our relationship with all other animals at this point, with very few exceptions, is an objectified relationship. Um, just to speak to some of the issues that Kathy will be speaking to, um, both fish and marine mammals face similar anthropocentric dangers. I'm going to give you a little taste of how their lives are in, intertwined. So let's talk about salmon and orcas in the Pacific Northwest. These animals are dealing with captivity, fish farms, overfishing, damming of the Chinook salmon runs, water pollution. The result is poor welfare and health for both fish and whales, death and uh, possible extinction. So in this example, we're talking about the orcas of the Salish Sea, which are southern resident orca population off the coast of Washington. And uh, they actually, this is their range. And this is a photo of a pod. There's three major matrilines within this population. Now, it turns out that this resident group of southern orcas only eat mostly Chinook salmon. 82% of what they eat is Chinook salmon. So their numbers rise and fall with Chinook salmon numbers. The reason they eat Chinook salmon, 
almost pri you know, exclusively, is the fact that that's their culture. That is their culture. They pass that on from one generation to the next. They, it would be difficult for them to just switch to eating seals or some other kind of fish because this is their very culturally bound beings. And it turns out that Chinook are declining. This is a photograph that shows a decline in Chinook salmon in that region. So this steep decline in Chinook is associated with all of the things you would expect. Habitat change, harvesting rates, hatchery influence, all the things that cause bad welfare and death for the Chinook salmon are also happening to the orcas. But here's the thing, here's where captivity and conservation intersect. So back in the 60s and 70s, um, the first orcas were captured uh, in the Salish Sea for entertainment. And these are two photographs of that capture. Um, at least 45 of these southern resident killer whales, mostly young females, were captured and delivered to marine parks between 1965 and 1973. The population has never recovered. They were devastated. Imagine taking all of the young females out of a population. That's it. In 2005, this killer whale population was listed as endangered. And here's a graph of time from 1976 to 2016 showing the rise and fall of the population. Here's the decimated population level right here from the captures. And you can see, yeah, they rose and fall, but they never quite were able to recover past, say, 100 individuals, which is nothing. So here we are, 2016, 2017. They're still trying to recover. They get the one-two punch of the Chinook salmon being dammed up and dying. And, and there's real talk about actually losing this population, extinction. There's just no time for them to recover. There was a little baby boom past couple of years, and those babies have died, mainly of malnutrition. Uh, I have very little time, so I'm gonna just go through this very quickly. There are legal protections, regulations, and policies that interface with captivity. Uh, some of these include the Endangered Species Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act, Animal Welfare Act, in-house regulation by the captivity industry itself, um, fox watching the hen house, and state legislation. And I really, I don't have time to go through all of these, but the important points are that the Marine pa Mammal Protection Act um, protects uh, the orcas but has loopholes that you could drive a, a truck through. And they include the fact that you can take animals if it's for research or public display. So all you have to do is say the words and there's some, you can, you can drive that truck right through that loophole. Animal Welfare Act, what am I gonna say? I think you all know how effective that is. Uh, regulation within and by the captivity industry, the AZA. Um, again, yeah, they, they regulate their own, but of course, you know, it's the fox watching the hen house. We have California legislation that has gone through and um, has been uh, successful in limiting the breeding uh, of captive orcas. Uh, Mainly the person behind this was uh, Richard Bloom, Assemblyman Richard Bloom. And we currently have the Florida Orca Protection Act, which is meant to do the same thing, but in Florida. And the ALDF is, is part of that. 
is the vanguard of that, and they're working to prohibit breeding of orcas in Florida, uh, transport of them in and out, and uh, basically uh, to push the idea that orcas held in captivity in Florida would only be held for rehabilitation or possibly research purposes. So I urge everyone to get behind the Florida Orca Protection Act. Um, little by little, we're eating away at, at this and phasing out uh, the um, breeding of these orcas, which is the first thing we have to do to phase out keeping them in these entertainment parks. So what do we still need? A lot. <laughs> We need recognition and, re and enforcement of legal rights um, and authentic and concrete forms of restitution. Uh, maybe not monetary restitution, but restitution nevertheless in, the, uh, in, in a way that orcas and the other dolphins and whales understand. Uh, we need Florida Orca Protection Act. Um, I work very closely with the Steve and the Non-Human Rights Project, and I am convinced that legal personhood rights for other animals is ultimately what we are going to have to uh, shift into uh, in order for animals to actually have um, enforceable rights and are not, ba are not um, subject to the whims, the welfare whims that we we tend to, to have. I mean, welfare is great. Um, rights, something altogether different. Um, restitution, sanctuaries. So in five minutes, I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about our effort to uh, enact that restitution in the form of sanctuaries. Because really, when you think about it, um, and you heard Ed Stewart uh, yesterday, who's actually on our advisory committee, talk about sanctuaries as more than just a place to live. It is a, a way of shifting the public conversation from we watch these animals in performances to having a more respectful relationship with them. And there are permanent sanctuaries for all kinds of large mammals, currently none for cetaceans at all. And we say, why not? So we formed the Whale Sanctuary Project uh, just about a year and a half ago. We're a nonprofit, uh, and we uh, made up of a group of scientists, engineers, advocates, attorneys, and all of the expertise that we will need to do this. And we are going to uh, create uh, a permanent seaside sanctuary where orcas and belugas can live in an environment that maximizes well-being and autonomy and is as close as possible to their natural habitat. So uh, what are the characteristics of a sanctuary? Well, as was, has been mentioned before, animal well-being is the priority. That's it. Period. It's the top. If your priority is anything other than the life of the residents, it's not a sanctuary. There's individual care, no breeding, um, trying to promote as natural life as possible. You can't do it completely, but you can give them back a little of what they lost by living in the entertainment industry. Um, we're going to be doing rescue rehab and reintroductions when possible. Um, and again, no invasive procedures, no explo exploitation, no breeding of any kind. We also plan to do a lot of education and outreach about conservation. We are completely transparent because we want to be a model. So this is not about, oh, we're the, going to be the first ones to do this. This is about doing it and doing it right, and then hoping that other people say, I can build one too. And before we know it, uh, we'll have all of these animals out of the tanks and into sanctuaries 
and eventually, as Ed Stewart said last night, years in the future, get rid of the sanctuaries because that, that whole thread will disappear. We won't have animals in captivity at all. So here's our rendering, here's our concept drawing. This is not a drawing of an actual place, but it gives you a visual of you know, what we want to build. We've been looking for sites uh, along both coasts, Washington State, British Columbia, Nova Scotia. We have found several of them. They are bays or coves where we can net off an area. Uh, we plan to have six to eight orcas and or beluga whales. Um, there will be 24-7 uh, veterinary staff uh, and training staff because you still have to do training. We're still going to have to feed them and so forth. Um, so we'll have a full service animal care and veterinary uh, facility. And there will be, um, uh, whoops, well, there will be, uh, an area where people can come to see the animals, but from a distance using scopes, um, there's going to be no in your face confrontation between humans and whales. And the thing that I'm very excited about is all the opportunities for education and outreach, um, especially with a lot of the virtual reality technology that we have today. So I wish I had time to talk more about that because. As an educator, I find that extremely exciting because it's not just about making a better life for a few whales, even though that's an incredible, you know, uh, laudable goal for anybody. It's about shifting our relationship with these animals. Um, I know I'm out of time. Uh, I just want to say that, you know, we have a long criterion list for the site selection. Um, so we take this very seriously. Uh, just to end, here's our timeline and milestones. Again, we started just in April 2016. Um, we have a 10-year strategic plan, a financial plan, uh, a five-person board, including uh, people like Carl Safina, who's a, a prominence conservationist, aquatic conservationist. Um, we brought on board Charles Vinnick as our executive director. Charles was the project manager for Keiko for four years. So we've got uh, marine mammal veterinarians from all over the world and, and people who have done rescue and rehab of dolphins. To put it bluntly, we know how to do this. We can do this. And we are going to be doing this by 2019. That's our goal, is to, by 2019, have a facility up and running with the first resident in it. And we will build out from there. We have a, a three-phase plan, so we're not so unrealistic that we think everything's going to be built by then. But that's still just a couple. That's not even... <laughs> That's a couple of years away. And uh, if we continue to get the support that we are and so forth, um, we're going to do this. You're going to see it. And if you want to hear more about it, uh, you can go to our, our website. Thank you so much for your time. Good morning. How's everyone holding up? The donuts kicking in? Good. Um, it's, thank you, Lori, for that, and thanks for being here, everybody. Um, okay. Whoops. Did it go back? There. So I'm here to talk about aquatic animals and agriculture. So Dr. Marino gave you a nice sort of overview of some of the scientific and some of the the information that if you didn't already have amazing empathy for these animals, right, then you have them hopefully now after hearing Dr. Reno and hearing Dr. Balcom last night. So I want to talk a little bit about a different environment, the animals finding themselves in aquaculture. Um, 
And so cognizant of the time, I'm hoping to go through this relatively quickly, but we can um, do more in-depth questions after. So um, like Dr. Marino, I want you to know what kinds of animals we're talking about. So when I say aquatic animals, I mean all aquatic animals. I mean freshwater, I mean marine animals. So these are all the animals that um, are marine animals and interest, or excuse me, aquatic animals, and they actually are all in agriculture at some place in the world. So people don't tend to think that all these animals are part of this industry, but they are. The picture here is of sea lions here in um, the Columbia River who have been um, targeted as nuisance animals because they have the temerity to eat salmon, okay, which is how they live. But they're eating too many salmon because of the fishing industry. They, they want to eat the salmon. They don't want to let the, these animals eat salmon. And these are actually endangered animals, but they still rank lower on the scale of priorities for us humans than the endangered salmon. Okay, this is a concept. This is actually not fact, right? Animals are in fact ingredients right now. But if we could imagine a world in which animals were not ingredients, think about the different legal framework, think about the different social structure, think about the different industrial approach we would have to these animals. So I recognize this is not a fact, but I encourage you to think about what it would look like and how you would feel about a world that looked differently in that way. All right. So the impact for um, fisheries and across the world is pretty significant. So I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. You've probably heard a bit about this already in different places in your life. So overfishing, this is from 1950 to 2006. It's getting worse. So we have significant overfishing, um, both the numbers of fish that are um, taken from the sea. So there are fewer fish available. People are having to go out further. Um, and the exploited and overfished and collapsed stocks are increasing as well. We have bycatch, which people have already talked about at this conference. And so these are fish or marine or aquatic animals. We're not even intending to catch, but we do. These animals do not count. When we talk about the numbers of animals involved in the industry, these numbers are not included in those national and international statistics. We have entanglements. These also are numbers that are not counted. These animals may be killed right away. They may be killed later on. Um, some may not be killed and live in sort of pain throughout their lives as a result of their engagement with the industry. Good. Pollution. Um, we have significant pollution from the aquaculture industry, and we'll talk about aquaculture a little bit um, in, the, in, in a minute. But we even have pollution from the, the native fisheries, the wild fisheries, wild caught fisheries industry from the ships and from their uh, gear that are in the ocean. All right, so we don't have any easy answers. As Dr. Marino said, um, sanctuaries are something we're hoping will really help, but I want to be really honest, right? There aren't easy answers because those animals will have to be fed fish, right? And so it's a complicated conversation, um, and so we don't want to tell you that you can just stop all of this all at once. And those animals will have to have been caught or farmed, and taking those animals to feed the other animals is going to have an impact on society. So our goals are to reduce the harm, right? To increase protections and to increase empathy. As you've heard a lot already over the last day and a half, if we don't see these animals, right? If we literally don't see these animals, we can't consider what their needs are. So we want to rise them up so you can see them, so we can have conscious, explicit conversations about what kinds of protections are appropriate. And we can make those choices as a society, but in order to do that, we have to increase their visibility and increase empathy for them. Okay, so let's talk about the industry for a minute. So wild caught and aquaculture, some people say capture, some people, they use different terminologies, but what I want you to understand is the ones that are sort of fished out of the ocean in the way that you would normally think or fished out of lakes and rivers, and the ones that are produced in a factory farm or factory sort of um, setting. Okay, so um, what are we doing with these animals? So. The industry is really important. It, it's a huge economic driver in lots of places. Um, and one of the things I think most people assume when they talk about the industry is, well, it's important. People have to eat. Well, yes, they do have to eat. But human consumption is only one of the sources that these animals go into, one of the aspects. And obviously, we don't have to eat these animals. But pet food, I bet people probably didn't realize how much um, 
how many other animals go into the pet food industry, and that is also a multi-billion dollar industry. We're also feeding fish to fish, right? So in the aquaculture industry, we're developing fish or we're taking them out of the oceans to feed to other fish, to feed to people or to pets or to livestock animals, um, fish oil and non-consumer uses. So we have significant uses for these animals that have nothing to do with human nutrition. Um, as I said, it's a, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. And when we talk numbers, as Dr. Balcom said last night, it's, we're not talking about individual animals because none of the statistics in the United States or in the European Union or the um, internationally count the individual animals. We're counting tonnage, right? How many tons of animals are taken or killed a year? And as you can see, the numbers are extremely high. All right, so let's talk about wild caught for a second. This is what people tend to think of, at least in the United States, but around the world. Um, when you think of fishing, right, people tend to think of this sort of bucolic picture, partly because this is how it started, right? This is what it used to look like, and human beings have fished for a really long time. There are long cultural um, traditions to be taken into account. So this is what we think it's like. This is more of what it's like. There are still people who fish um, in the way you see in the previous slide, but this is what's devastating, right? The, the community of animals and the, and, the, um, and the environment, the ecosystems. So we have, even the um, small boats, right, have a really large impact. It's pretty amazing how efficient this industry is. And this is a, a fleet of small boats, just one, right? So imagine how many fleets of these small boats just in a country, right? This is one fleet in one area. Larger boats have the larger impact. So this is the net, okay? I'm not sure if it's really clear. So this is the part of the net gathering up the animals. This is the net, and beyond that is the actual ocean. So again, right, that's one boat. This is a fleet of boats like that again, in one city, in one country in the world. These are whales that were killed, not for food, not for any industrial use, but because they were eating the fish the fishermen wanted to catch. These are, people are probably familiar with this slide, shark fins, right? So these animals were not caught, again, for food. Uh, the shark fins do go into soup, but these are just the parts of the animals that we want, the rest of the animals thrown back, typically, into the ocean. So what are the numbers? So 91.2 million tons of fish caught in these, through these methodologies every year in the US. Our contribution is 5 million tons. It's actually decreased a little bit this past year, at least in the June numbers. Um, so we'll see what happens. And as I said before, so lots, of number, lots of animals who are killed aren't counted in these numbers. Entanglements, bycatch, poaching, incidental kills, uh, certain categories are not included, reptiles, amphibians, and seabirds. All right, so then what does aquaculture look like? Sorry, this is depressing. Um, but it's good to know, right? You can't do anything about it if you don't know. Okay, so here's the numbers on the aquaculture industry. So in 2014, we had 74 million tons. The most important metric here is 2017, 82.5 million tons. And the numbers are expected to increase pretty exponentially. So most of the fish that are being used for any purpose are expected to come from these methodologies, right? Aquaculture methodologies. Um, so we're expecting a 33% increase in that system and only a 3% increase in the fishery system. Okay, so fastest growing in the United States, 1.3 billion fish in US aquaculture alone, and that's the United States, and we are way behind the other countries and keen to catch up, as you might imagine, right? Okay, so half of edible aquatic animals come from aquaculture already now. The statistics just two years ago was that it was gonna take us another five years to get there, and so we have beat that number. So aquaculture is outperforming its expectations. 90% of um, the fish coming from this industry comes from Asia. The reason I mention that is because Asia has even fewer regulations um, than other countries do, and that's along all metrics. That's for pollution, for um, worker safety, and certainly they don't have animal welfare protections, not that we do. Um, so something to be considered about. All right, what do these systems look like? There are a lot of really unique, um, people have spent some 
significant time engineering ways to create creatures to um, take in these ways. So some of them are in the oceans. You've probably heard a lot about the problems with these systems, the pollution, um, fish escapes, genetically modified fish that escape, um, parasites, lice, all kinds of things we could talk significantly about. Sometimes you'll see pictures in the earlier stages of the development of these fish, and they seem like they have a lot of space, right? So there's these teeny little fish sort of swimming around in what looks like a big pen. But this is pretty much what it looks like at the end, right? There's absolutely no space for them, and many die. There are many, many of these pens, right, in each of these facilities. Um, and many of these facilities increasingly around the world. Lots of different styles and methodologies. That is an aquaculture facility, right? We're taking wetlands, we're taking um, land away from other ecosystems. Some very creative um, and interesting systems. Some are also, so those are all in the water. These are land-based systems. We have some that, when I say factory farming, right, there are actual factories developing fish indoors, no natural sunlight. Um, there are all kinds of systems on the land and they interact, as you might imagine, with the natural systems in relatively negative ways. That's a facility, right? Do anyone want to eat anything coming out of that? <laughs> it's kind of scary. Um, okay, so in the US, what's the system look like? So we don't have as robust a system, both regulatory to pro protect animals, but also even to promote, but we are catching up. So NOAA has just recently approved um, the concept of deep sort of ocean or offshore, deep offshore fishing, so not those real coastal ones. Um, interestingly, they decided that the Gulf was the right place to start in the U.S. with everything else going on in the Gulf, right? Fracking and oil and yeah, yeah, let's, let's go do it there. Um, so there's a lawsuit filed already. We'll be glad to know. So it's kind of held up. And nobody has actually filed, no industry member has filed to, to start there. Um, so we'll see what happens. They might actually have a sense that it's not a really good location to go. Um, but the plans were, yeah, 64 million pounds of seafood annually could come from the Gulf from this production methodology. The only person that has actually um, applied for a permit right now is SeaWorld. The hub SeaWorld Rose Canyon Fisheries off the San Diego coast. People are pretty upset. The local fisheries folks are upset. Um, they want it four miles off the coast. This is a picture of just one of their um, sort of pods. But they have some that are um, designed to be a mile long. Right, a mile long, which seems pretty stunning, but that's actually relatively routine for the nets that people drop into the oceans, right? The long lines and... So what are the problems with this um, methodology? So um, from a regulatory perspective, you only need to... Um, so we do have some of these systems um, in the United States already. You only need to report what is called a major escapement event. So that's only 10% more of, in those big facilities have escaped. There's no protections for interbreeding, for escapes, for pharmaceutical impacts. These fish are fed pharmaceuticals just in the same way animals and the terrestrial animals are fed factory, uh, in factory farms. There's no protections against the pollution problems, the diseases, or the viruses. And so for those folks who don't live in the Northwest um, Pacific Northwest region here, you may not have heard that just a month or so ago we had a huge release. So there was a facility that had over 405,000 um, fish in an aquaculture facility. 305,000 of those animals escaped. 160,000 were not recovered. Okay, so you had 160,000 fish in the sort of Puget Sound area, which is again a very sensitive um, area, right? Where exactly. the, the southern right whales. So people were kind of going a little ballistic, saying, "This is outrageous. What are we going to do? These fish." have diseases, they have parasites, some of them, they're genetically modified, there's questions about interbreeding, there's questions about um, so many significant problems. And so I'm sure you can guess what the government's response was. Everybody go catch them, right? You don't need like permits right now, just everybody, everybody please just go catch these fish. Like, oh, there's one, like, <laughs> right? I can see it. 500 feet down, it's just it's ludicrous, right? So we don't have systems in place to manage these 
facilities. We don't have systems in place to deal with the um, negative consequences of them being in place, and we don't have systems in place to deal with the problems that occur from the facilities. So, um, and this happens, people tend to overfish in certain areas, right? So just a few years back, there was already another um, escapement of over 369 unrecovered fish. So, so we've been talking obliquely about some of the harms. We can talk a little bit more. So the pesticides are pretty significant, and pesticide impacts come from a number of different inputs. So the pesticides that are used on whatever the fish are being fed, so sometimes that's plant material, sometimes that's other fish material, there's pesticides at that input, and there's pesticides directly applied to some of these facilities, to some of these fish, to keep down some of the problems, right? But those pesticides obviously go into these water bodies in a really negative way. Antibiotics, as, as um, Dr. Marino has already said, it's not just tilicum, right? It's all these fish, because we don't want them to get sick, because we want them to mature significantly in size so that they can meet market demand. Pharmaceuticals, they're being fed. Um, the fish waste is, again, anytime you have any concentrated population of animals, you're going to have concentrated waste, and you're going to have it um, past agronomic levels, which means past the level that the system, the natural system, can absorb and use um, in a positive way. We have things like copper sulfite on nets, right, to keep the algae off. And we have dry pellet feed, which is a whole, we could talk about that for a long time. We also have, I should say, these nets also break down in the oceans and they, they create their own pollution. They, some of them are plastic and they have microbeads that they sort of develop into, but they have other pollution effects as well. And it's not a very efficient form. As you know from terrestrial land animals, it takes a lot more food to feed to animals to feed to humans, and this is exactly true. I put the most conservative estimate, which is two pounds. I've seen upwards of seven pounds of input to create a pound of fish flesh for food coming out. So, um, and then we have some significant um, physiological deformities and disease in these animals. More than 50% of farmed cod are deformed, more than 50% of US catfish contaminated with dioxin, which does not break down. Um, so that lives with us for a very long time. So, not very good. So, we have a lot of things to think about, right? Um, and these are entirely different categories, sorry. Brace yourselves for a little bit more. Um, we don't have any laws that regulate how these animals are killed. We have some laws, right, the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act, that regulate some terrestrial animals, but we have nothing for these animals, nothing. And the methods of slaughter are unbelievable. Right? I'm, oops, I'm not going to go through all these because it's hard enough for you to just look at, but there's no regulation for any of these methodologies. Okay? We have welfare considerations. So this, this follows some of what we've just been talking about because of the disease, the stress, the infighting, crowding, pollution, um, the pharmaceutical, the growth deformities, transport. Um, we don't have rules, any of our transport rules that cover aquatic animals. So when they're being transported to the facilities, from the facilities, alive or dead, we don't have um, any regulation. So this, just so you can get a sense of what we're talking about, what the industry sort of is striving for. So I hope it's relatively clear. This is, this is a farm salmon. This is not a natural salmon. This is a farm salmon already, and this is a GMO salmon. They are both 18 months old, right? So obviously, you can see that the industry wants this animal because they're going to bring in a lot more money. Right? So this is the why we have a push for gen genetically modified and farmed fish. I would love, um, and we just don't have it, uh, or I w didn't have access to it, to have a third animal down here saying, a natural salmon. Let's see what that one looks like, right? Because it's going to look different. Um, this is just a quick example of the kind of disease the animals can get in these facilities. So take a pause. OK, everybody all right? I'm sorry. I know this is traumatic knowledge, so I apologize. Um, but this is something that, as a lawyer, it took me a little while to get to, right? How important the science was, how, as an attorney, I had to learn what science was. I had to learn how to talk to scientists. I had to benefit from their work. I had to ask them questions and figure out how to use their talent and their energy and their work um, to supplement mine and to support mine. So we have people like Dr. Balcom and Dr. Marino who are telling us things that we as lawyers can use. And so it's taken me a while to sort of develop a facility, but it's something all of us can do and should do. So there's good news, all right? 
There are studies that show that aquatic animals have all of these kinds. And, and to be really clear, I don't mean every single aquatic animal has every single one of these capacities. Okay? There are some studies that show at least some aquatic animals have these capacities. So I'm just going to let that sink in. Right? These are pretty amazing. And we heard a lot from Dr. Balcom last night and Dr. Marino this morning. So what this makes me think is that we have enough data not from a scientific point of view, because they have a different sort of standard of proof, but from a legal point of view, for us to start flipping the paradigm, right? I think we need to change our default and say, I think animals are sentient until you prove otherwise, right? Because it doesn't make sense, biologically speaking, that a being would be created that doesn't have um, some defense mechanisms against negative, you know, indicia like pain. Right? It doesn't make sense. That's sort of how the evolutionary biology works, as far as I understand it. So I think we have enough data to say, yeah, all animals. And that obviates some of the questions that Dr. Balcom got last night. Let's just start at the bottom, wherever that is. Find me the bottom, and let's include them all, and you prove to me that they don't deserve protections. How about we do that? It's not going to happen, I know, but a girl can dream, right? Um, and we can work on that. But one of the things I think we can say is that the law really needs to incorporate science and it needs to follow science, it needs to push science. Science, we still need to push scientists, right? We still need to educate them too. But we need to incorporate recent scientific information into regulatory decision making. And that is not even a mandate in many of these areas, right? So we are relying, regulatory decision makers in this country are relying on scientific information that is very, very dated, and there's not a requirement that they change things, at least not sufficiently. Here's a quick example of how science evolves. So the picture here is of an OPA, and I'll explain why it matters. The Animal Welfare Act started by saying it was protecting warm-blooded animals, and then it got sort of more specific, right? Well, do we have warm-blooded fish? It's not what we think of, right? There's warm-blooded sort of the mammals, and we have marine mammals, but not fish. Fish are sort of definitionally not warm-blooded, right? That's sort of what I learned in fifth grade. Well, it turns out obviously not to be true. So we have partially warm-blooded, but the OPA is actually the first animal discovered in 2015 that's fully warm-blooded. So exothermic and endothermic, I could talk about that later. I probably will forget if I don't have it written down. Um, but the point is, it has a legal implication. So if the Animal Welfare Act still said, we're gonna protect warm-blooded animals, does this animal get protection? I would say yes, right? So it's something that we're looking into. All right, quick tour through the law because I could pretty much say there's not a lot of law and that's really your only takeaway from here, right? <laughs> so the way that you know um, animal law has evolved, we focused on certain categories of animals. We start, started working on transportation animals, actually way, way back, companion animals. Then we started working on factory farmed animals. But even there, we weren't focusing so much on the poultry animals. We were focusing on the, right? And so we're trying to sort of open the lens to the animals who count. Um, and aquatic animals, from our perspective, are the next category of animals. So what protections do they have? They're excluded from most of the laws, um, and I will just say this sort of at the outset. They're either excluded, but more often what happens is they're not even explicitly excluded, and that's because it was so clear they were never even on the table. Okay, so I'm just going to say that again, because most animal laws, you say, here are the animals that count, except we don't count these, and they're either by species or entire category. We don't even need to say aquatic animals aren't included because it's been so clear. All right, that's how bad the legal framework is for these animals. But it's not completely hopeless and we're working to make it better. Um, so there are 10 states in which the fish are not excluded. And I'm saying fish here generally for aquatic animals, but in some of these it would be fish. Um, 20 states don't explicitly exclude them, but they have agricultural exemptions as many states do. So slaughter laws, no coverage, AWA, transportation, breeding, little, right? We just don't have them included in our, in our traditional regulatory system, so we have a lot of work to do. Um, there are some protections, as Dr. Marino said, we have the Endangered Species Act, the Mammal Protection Act, um, as I said, some anti-cruelty acts. But when we're talking about fisheries, when we're talking about these kinds of animals, there are a lot of laws, 
a lot of laws, but they pretty much are designed around a few things. They're managing trade and commerce and sometimes consumer protection and more recently conservation, right? So there are a lot of laws, but that's what they end up focusing on. There is some hope. We do have some protected areas in the United States. Other jurisdictions, the European Union, Australia, New Zealand, other places have these as well. And so these, um, and in the US, they're called either um, marine monuments or marine sanctuaries. And, and together, we have 14 of them. We have the two most recent ones that were designated are, are um, being considered for review by our current administration. So who knows whether we'll have 14 or whether we won't. But, um, but these are a concept to protect areas of ocean so the ocean can repair itself, right? So these animals wouldn't be fished in these areas, or at least there would be in some at all, and in some they would be really reduced um, exposure to fishing and to other harms, um, including even tourism, right? So thinking about this as a legal framework for protecting these animals and protecting against all of those harms that we've talked about is one way to go, and there, and there are others. So this is our goal, right? We want healthy animals, healthy ecosystems, healthy environment for everyone, for them, for the planet, for the people. Um, and so that's what we're working on. So thank you. We're going to open up to questions now. Um, so we have a mic at the front. Yeah, can you? I'd like to think I was friends with Keiko. Um, we, I have a scuba dive a lot, and we had a place about 10 miles south of uh, Newport when he was at the Oregon Coast Aquarium. They had a volunteer divers program and to clean the tanks. And so you would clean the tanks, and he would come up and nudge you on the shoulder because he, was, he couldn't speak because the, 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 the pings would bounce off the concrete walls right back into his face. And he, the, 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 the toys they put out didn't do very much. But he liked to watch television. So I know with the big, the big viewing screen or the big window about five feet below the, the surface, after visiting hours, they would set up a widescreen TV before, before high definition, and he would watch movies. I wondered how he would react to Star Trek for the voyage home. But his favorite movie was Blazing Saddles. And because it was back in VHS time, and he would watch it and be just under the surface and just watch it. For, he would binge watch television because there's not much else he could do except if he had a choice between the diver and TV, he would, he would, he would hang out with the diver and look over their shoulders as they're scrubbing the side of the tank. And it was, a really, it was just really awful what happened. I mean, I know you probably know the, the, the board was torn down the middle. There was financial issues. The, the new La Quinta owner and the motels that were built up all around it, you know, since Newport's such a small town, wanted him to stay, and, they, and every, all the divers knew there just wasn't a snowball's chance in hell that he was going to make it when they shipped him to the other side of the world, you know, when he died of pneumonia. But it was, I, I mean, I, if you know, if you, it's a little, if you know, if you have a, you know him, you know his personality and what happened to him. It's kind of blunt, but we really fucked him up. So I just, I mean, it just when you, and he had the droopy fan and the whole thing, you know. So um, I just thought I wanted to mention I'm really glad that you're working on sanctuaries closer so you don't have to throw them out in the ocean because that, that, that uh, inlet that they, they used, I mean, that was, he wasn't going to make it. You know, he wanted to watch TV. So you don't, I might as well throw my golden retriever out into the Yukon or something. So it was kind of like that. So I just wanted to mention that when you have had a personal relationship and you do know them, and that's what happens to them, it becomes real personal. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, the thing that uh, Charles Vinnick, who is the project manager for mm -hmm. Keiko, says time and time again, it's very easy to capture an orca. It's very difficult to put them back where they belong. And so 
And that's why we've decided to create a sanctuary that would be able to care for these animals, these residents, for the rest of their lives, not push them necessarily to go out and be released or reintroduced as test cases, um, just so that um, we want to see that happen. Um, Keiko's life was messed up from the time that he was captured uh, and put into the entertainment industry, and everyone did their best. We've learned a lot, and uh, we hope that eventually there will be no need for any of this kind of thing. So well, I, I do know when you got into the tank, when you could hear the bubbles from the scuba tanks, it would be like a dinner bell. Oh, there's someone here to see me. Because he didn't react that much to the people behind the glass uh, that much. Although he, that's where they put up the big widescreen TV, and that's where he, would, he, he certainly knew the difference. And when you, when you know him well enough to know what his favorite movie was, by the way he reacted, it's pretty bad when it's what happened to him. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, um, I had a question, um, one for Dr. Marino, one for Professor Hessler, and I was just curious, um, you mentioned um, that the, there are no sanctuaries right now for cetaceans, and so a few years ago there were, um, I guess since the blackfish came out and um, the whole uh, telecom fiasco occurred, I was wondering, there, there's arguments and counter-arguments about, um, some people said that you need to release all these captive orcas into the wild and the counter argument is well that do doesn't make sense if they've been bred into captivity they wouldn't survive and so I mean before the sanctuary is you know comes into existence what I mean what's the state of play here what what can uh, what can is there anything that can be done about it are they supposed to stay in captivity and then for Professor Hessler I was wondering I think you mentioned the UN Convention of Law of the Sea um, on your slide and I was wondering how um, effective, if at all, that's been in terms of uh, regulating um, uh, marine mammals? Well, thanks for your question. Uh, yeah, there is no alternative for orcas and other uh, cetaceans uh, in marine parks right now. The alternative is sanctuary. And as far as release is concerned, or reintroduction, as we'd like to say, that really depends, that has to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. It's pretty clear, though, that if uh, a whale, an orca, was born into captivity, that they are, don't have the skills they need to survive. They're very cultural beings. Um, they're not just, they need to join up with a family group or a social group in order to really survive, um, and they, they just don't have the experience and the skills to do that. Uh, so sanctuary is, is really, really the alternative to the concrete tanks. And I'll just add really quickly that people are working on um, improving, given all of that, the welfare of the animals who are still in captivity. And so certainly ending the breeding, um, and there are lawsuits and petitions um, to the different agencies about the conditions that the animals are currently in. So people are working on that. I don't know whether to be hopeful about that, but people are working on that. And so people are working on, you know, what we're in right now, the transition to where we want to be, and then what that might look like, and then hopefully, you know, not having any of these questions in the future. So there are wonderful people working on all of those. Um, and as for your question, I think it depends on which law we're looking at over which period of time and which part of the country or the world, but most of the laws that we have, the regimes were designed, as I said, for commerce, right, or for conservation. And so if you're asking whether conservation, I'll say one thing that's maybe really helpful, I should have put this in my slide, that of all the environmental problems we have in the world, overfishing is one we can solve very, very quickly. And the scientists have told us this, and even the industry knows this. If we just change our practices a bit, we don't even have to end all of the fishing. We can change and eliminate some of these problems. We can get the fishing stocks back up to where they need to be within a space of 10 to 15 years, which is pretty amazing. Um, so people are, are working on that. I wouldn't say I think any of these laws are successful at dealing with the welfare of the animals because that's not what they're designed to do. So that's sort of my bottom line answer for all of them. Thank you. Hello, I'm Sejal. Uh, thank you, Professor Hessler and Dr. Marino for a terrific presentation and the work you do uh, on behalf of marine mammals. 
Dr. Marino, you mentioned the California Orca Protection Act and the currently pending Florida Orca Protection Act. I know on the yeah. federal level, there's the Orca Care and Advancement Act that's currently pending in yeah. Congress to close the loophole in the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Do you think a state-by-state -state approach is more politically viable and potentially more effective, or is it critical to have a federal Orca Protection Act? Thank you. Uh, the question is, should this be state-by-state -state or federal? And I say yes, 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 yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We need to have protection at all levels, truly. Um, I'm not trying to be glib and answer. Um, the Adam Schiff law, which is the, the federal law, um, hasn't really gone anywhere. Um, we're hoping that we can resurrect it at some point. The, the more layers we can put in place legally, um, the, 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 the less difficult it will be to, to regulate. So yes, we need state laws. Um, and, and also, the thing is, we have a state law, the California law, and um, what actually ended the breeding mm -hmm. was the fact that SeaWorld made, uh, had an agreement with the HSUS mm -hmm. to end the breeding. Um, and so there's, you know, sometimes these laws uh, come into play, but they, they really don't, you know, have a lot of teeth. Mm -hmm. um, so I say everything that we can put in place to make it more and more difficult for these entertainment parks to do what they do better. Thank you. And I'll just add really quickly. Um, so even the laws that we do have, so the slide I showed are the sea lions, right? So we had marine mammal protection and endangered species protection and they still aren't protected. So that's the downside. The upside is Part of the reason that the California Coastal Commission case went the way it did in California that led to, right, that was a permit denial, that wasn't even a law, right? So think about what happened with Ringling, right? Think about those local ordinances you can pass against the bull hook or against wild elephants in captivity or, so there, so don't just think about state and federal, um, think about local as well. Absolutely. And in these um, times, I would just say strategically, do whatever you think will work right? Anything that you can do, people can build on. And so it's a really challenging time to work in the legislative process. So whatever you think will work, but don't forget the local. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks both for your presentation. Question for Lori. Um, do you have any, uh, I'm interested to know what your strategy will be for acquiring um, cetaceans for rehabilitation and have you had any conversations with SeaWorld or other of those entities and what kind of response do you get? Uh, uh, thanks for your question. So clearly, you know, we, we are going to uh, need uh, orcas and belugas to become available once we build this and our, and our idea is very much if you build it they will come. Um, we see, we have reached out to SeaWorld, to a number of other facilities that keep these animals and we have said, let's sit down and have a conversation. Let us not, this is not about destroying SeaWorld. This is about doing better for these animals. Um, and we know from behind the scenes that they, that it is on the table, the sanctuary idea. And we're, you know, we're, we extended a hand publicly and through different channels to say, when you're ready, um, let's talk. And I think they're waiting to see um, if we actually put a shovel in the ground. I mean, they're waiting to see that we're serious, and you bet we are. And as soon as we do, I think once we have a site, which we will have by the beginning of next year, in just a few months, um, we're hoping that they will come around. So it's a very complex dance that we're doing with the, the industry. They know we're here and they know we want to talk to them and eventually it will happen. Thanks. Hi, thanks so much for a really effective presentation and all the information you shared. The question that I have is along a little bit of a different line and that is, um, can you just speak briefly to some of the fish that end up in people's homes, in aquariums, or in commercial places in aquariums? 
right. Yeah, um, we're out of time, so I'm going to just say really quickly um, that this is something, there is some information about it. It's really pretty horrific. Some of those fish are captured using cyanide, using explosive methodologies. And there's way more breeding of even animals like goldfish than you would ever imagine. So it's a significant driver of additional misery, additional ecosystem destruction, and, and people don't realize it. So thank you for the question. We don't have time to go into depth, but it's a significant problem. And again, people are working on it. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much to our panelists.